Welcome, Chris. We have a pers- we have officially pressed record. Yes. So you were going to give us a detailed synopsis on the conversation up till this point? <laughs> uh, you know, I was, but you know, astonishingly enough, I forgot everything I was going to say. Yes. <laughs> Which seems appropriate to this <laughs> to dialogue. Well, I think where we left off, I, I don't even, there was that, there was that point where last time, I mean, it was really pretty cool where I think they went on five or six pages, not saying the thought yeah. that they were bearing. Yeah. Like, and then I, I think we also started to imitate, we started to imitate the same pattern. Yeah. <laughs> all right i will how about if i i'll start i'll be i and you be j okay okay i don't remember what oh yeah, okay so i i'm i guess i'm heidegger and you're the japanese philosopher yes um yes so we're on we're on for the people watching we're on page 37 okay It is not easy to go counter to that tendency. Such procedures in good time are smothered by their own sterility. But what requires our contribution is a different matter. Which would be? To give heed to the trails that direct thinking back into the region of its source. Do you find such trails in your own attempt? I find them only because they are not of my own making and are discernible only quite rarely, like the wind-borne echo of a distant call. But I would gather then that in the distinction expression and appearance, you are no longer basing yourself on the subject-object relation. You will see it even more clearly if you attend to what I would now like to add to your mention of Kant's concept of appearance. Kant's definition is based on the event that everything present has already become the object of our representation. In appearance as Kant thinks of it, our experience must already include the object as something in opposition to us. That is necessarily not only in order to understand Kant properly, but also and above all else so that we may experience the appearing of the appearance, if I may put it that way originally. How does this happen? The Greeks were the first to experience and think of um, phenomena as phenomena. But in that experience, it is thoroughly alien to the Greeks to press present beings into an opposing, to, to an opposing objectness. Phenestia means to them that a being assumes its radiance and in that radiance it appears. Thus appearance is still the basic trait of the presence of all present beings as they rise into unconcealment. That's cool. Mm. Accordingly, In your title, Expression and Appearance, you use the second noun in the Greek sense? Yes and no. Yes, in that for me, the name appearance does not name objects as objects, and least of all as objects of consciousness. Consciousness always means um, self-consciousness. Heidegger does not like the word consciousness. Hmm. In short, appearance not in the Kantian sense. 
Merely to contrast it with Kant is not enough. For even where the term object is used for present beings as subsisting within themselves, and Kant's interpretation of objectness is rejected, we are still far from thinking of appearance in the Greek sense, but fundamentally, though, rather in a very hidden sense in the manner of Descartes in the term of the I as subject. Yet your no suggests that you too do not think of appearance in the Greek sense. You're right. What is decisive here is difficult to render visible because it calls for simple and free vision. Such vision obviously is still rare. For usually your definition of appearance is equated sight unseen with that of the Greeks. And it is considered a foregone conclusion that your thinking has no other aim than a return to Greek and even pre-Socratic thinking. That opinion is foolish, of course, and yet it has something in mind that is correct. How so? To answer your question with the necessary brevity, I would venture a turn of phrase, which is at once open to new misinterpretations. Which you, however, can counter just as quickly. Certainly. If it did not cause further delays in our dialogue, whose time is limited because tomorrow you will leave again to go to Florence. I have already decided to stay for another day, if you will allow me to visit you again. There is nothing I would rather do, but even with this pleasant prospect, I must keep the answer short. How is it then with your relation to the thinking of the Greeks? Our thinking today is charged with the task to think what the Greeks have thought in an even more Greek manner. The think and so I just want to say, hang on a second. <laughs> Let me get, get that, I want to grok that. Our thinking today is charged with the task to think what the Greeks have thought in an even more Greek manner, hmm. right? And so to understand the Greeks better than they have understood themselves. No, that is not it. For all great thinking always understands itself best of all. That is to say, itself within the limits set for it. Then what does it mean to think what the Greeks have thought in an even more Greek manner? It can be readily explained with a view to the essence of appearance. If to be present itself is thought of as appearance, then there prevails in being present the emergence into openness in the sense of unconcealedness. The unconcealedness comes about in the unconcealment as clearing, but this clearing itself as occurrence remains unthought in every respect. So, so think Sinyata here and mm. hearing and just, I'm not sure, but we'll see. Mm. To enter into thinking, this unthought occurrence means to propose more originally what the Greeks have thought, to see it in the source, in the source of its reality. To see it so is in its own Greek way, and yet in respect of what it sees is no longer, if never again, Greek. Mm. Let, me just, uh, let me read that one more time. It's a good idea. It, it can be readily explained with a view to the essence of appearance the essence of appearance. If to be present itself is thought of as appearance, then there prevails in being present 
the emergence into openness in the sense of unconcealedness. This unconcealedness comes about in the unconcealment as clearing. Okay, so it's like it appears and it appears by virtue of which then it prevails in being present in, in uh, being present the emergence into into openness in the sense of unconcealment. All right, so the openness the openness as unconcealment, right? This unconcealedness comes about in the unconcealment as a clearing. Does that mean that the clearing appears? Not sure. Mm -hmm. but, but this clearing itself, okay, the clearing itself as occurrence remains unthought in every respect. Okay, so, so it's a current, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's appearing, but it's unthought in every respect, even by the Greeks, I think. To enter into, to enter into thinking this unthought occurrence means to pursue more originally what the Greeks have thought, to see it in the source of its reality source of its reality. So see the clearing in, at, in occurrence in its source of reality. To see it so is in its own way Greek. To see it so is in, in its own way Greek. And yet in respect of what it sees no longer is never again Greek. This is a pretty oblique one, yeah. even, even for him. Um, at yeah. least to my ears it is. Yeah. Um, but, but what I'm, yeah, the sense is, the sense what I'm getting is that, that The logos of Greekness, the logos of, the logos of thought Greekness, if we can say there is such a thing, right? That which calls the Greeks to their speech, that which, which calls the Greeks to their manner of thought, yeah, is the logos that arranges the intelligible order of their thinking, yeah. And it is more Greek than even the Greeks, precisely because it is originary to the thought that draws the speech of the Greeks yep. and the thought yep. that draws their philosophy. Mm -hmm. So that being the case, to enter into the thinking of the unthought occurrence, which we could say for the purpose of this is like the invisible logos that right. manifests the order of attention yeah. that tunes the Greek mode of thinking and the Greek manner of speech. Right. To enter into thinking the unthought occurrence is to pursue the, the logos of arrangement that draws together Greek thought into the form that we know it to be as Greek, Greek with a capital G. Right. right. And so it's more Greek than Greek because it's, it is, it is the, I mean, it's in, in a formal sense, right? You can think of it. it I mean, I, I I default to thinking of it in a platonic sense, right? I default to thinking of a platonic Greekness. Yeah. Um, that the platonic Greekness is more Greek than, than any, 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 yeah, any manifest instance instance of Greekness, and to enter into the unthought logos of Greekness mm -hmm. is precisely to draw one's thought in conformity to the form of Greekness yeah. that is behind and before and beyond and thereby unknown even to Greek. Right, and the unknown, I think he's kind of pointing to is this, is the clearing, right, that allows, it's the, it's the, I don't know, is it the clearing 
that make is the is the room making for the logos to do the Greek organization. Like there's the clearing, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. I think what he's saying is that to think it more Greekly is to where the where the Greeks thought within the Greek clearing, but to but to make it more Greek is to think the clearing that they think within, right? There's something about the clearing as a current, right? The clearing that allows. See, I'm wondering if that's it's kind of it's kind of like saying the emptiness of because aletheia the greek sense of truth the pure i think the pure the pureness of aletheia and it's like purity is sanyata right it's like a generative nothing right it's absolute emptiness because pure unconcealment, right, would be yeah, it just seems like that that would be it. <laughs> right? Yeah, it would be like I'm tempted to think of it as a kind of coming into Greekness. Hmm. That what could be more Greek than Greekness? It would be the coming into Greekness. Right. Right? Yeah. I, that's how I'm, I'm, yeah. So when we talk about the, un, the unconcealment of the, the unconcealment of the Greek thought refers back to the coming into Greekness. Yeah. That is more Greek than Greekness precisely because it's originary. Yeah. Precisely because it's originary and yeah. because yeah. it's, not and can't be, I suppose, exteriorized. Yeah. And an object of Greekness. Yeah. I'm going to read and it one more time. Yeah. 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 This one's a. Let me yeah. read it one more time and then let's just go. Let's go through and play the music a little bit more and then okay. see, if it, see if the clearing can clear itself up. Clear itself up. Yeah. It can be readily explained with the view to the essence of appearance. Okay, wait a minute, so the essence of, it can be ready explained with the view of the essence of appearance. Okay, so the essence of appearance, the hand appears, right? If, if to be present itself is thought, as, thought of as appearance, so present and appearance, wait a minute, to be present itself is thought of as appearance. So present equals appearance. Then there, prevail, there prevails in being present, what prevails through that being present that's appearing, the emergence into openness in the sense of unconcealedness. Okay, so this is saying something. Okay, now I'm just thinking I'm starting to get it. So I think what he's calling, what's coming into the open in appearance, which is makes itself like presence and makes itself known as appearance, right? They're basically kind of the same thing, right? Or they point to each other very closely. Then there prevails a being present, the emergence into openness. Okay, the emergence in the openness of this presence, of this appearing presence, in the sense of unconcealment. So where that gets its sense is unconcealment. See, I'm wondering if, because we could say that it's like, well, what gets unconcealed, right, is the, is the presence of the appearance, right? But we could also say that what gets unconcealed is unconcealment. <laughs> which I think is different, mm. right? Like, what is it What is it for? I mean, I think it's similar to like light. Like light is completely unconcealed and it's revealing everything that it, that it, that it, that it lights, but it's, it also withdraws in revealing everything that it lights. So it's, right, light, 
I think it's something like that. It's like, it's, it, I think it's something subtle like that. Okay, let's just, I'll just keep reading. Um, this unconcealedness comes about in, in the unconcealment as a clearing. This unconcealedness comes about in the unconcealment as a clearing. Okay, okay. So what appears by virtue of which in the sense of unconcealment, right? comes about as a clearing. Okay, that's that's why I think it's like, okay, that's why you think it's, it's like, if we can think this, to think it more Greek than the Greeks thought it is to somehow think the clearing, right? Um, but this clearing itself as occurrence remains unthought in every respect. Okay, yeah, so the clearing doesn't occur for the Greeks, mm -hmm. right? To enter into thinking, this unthought occurrence means to pursue more originally what the Greeks have thought. Okay, so, so essentially to, see, to, to pursue the origin of what's originary for them, right? To bring it to, bring it to appearance in itself, right? Mm -hmm. Right? W means more originally what the Greeks have thought. To mm -hmm. see it in the source of its reality. See in the source of its reality. To see it so, to see it so is in its own way Greek. And yet in respect of what it sees is no longer, is never again Greek. Hmm. Wow. That, that last part does make sense because it's, Because, because to bear witness, to bear witness to the clearing, let's say, right, the, let's say, take the Greek idiolect, yeah. the, the unconcealment of the Greek idiolect yeah. must, must bear its understanding beyond its Greekness. Right, because Greekness does not emerge from Greekness. Yeah, right. And that's why, that's why that form of now that I think what he means is or perhaps I I really don't know, but perhaps it's that 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 particular question, that particular form of inquiry, the form of inquiry that inquires the Greekness is very Greek, but fundamentally the unconcealment of Greekness must exceed Greekness. And that's why it cannot ever again be in its unconcealment. Right. It cannot be nearly Greek. Is that, is that why, like, like I don't have an accent to myself, mm -hmm. right? Is that the, basically the same thing as like, is it the same kind of concealment, like the way that our own dialect in our own countries, because it's so indigenous, we don't we don't have an accent to our to to it to itself, to ourselves. That's an interesting analogy. Mm -hmm. I think it would be like saying. I think it would be like saying, okay, there's guy, guy has kind of a Chicago accent, right? Guy's Chicago accent. The appearance of guy's accent is of Chicago, for instance. Right. right. But the unconcealment of Guy Sengstock's accent. That in and of itself can't be. What am I trying to say here? Mm -hmm. Or what's trying to be said? There, well, what's trying to be said? Yeah. Um. 
ultimately what I'm trying not to I'm I'm trying not to apply a kind of a kind of um I'm trying not to, I'm not I'm trying I'm not trying uh, I'm trying not to vivisect this because to because it's not the, the point is not to break down in your to use your analogy the point is not to break down the accent into its component parts because of course we break down the accent into its component parts we inevitably we either by reduction or by transcendence I suppose depending on how you figure it yeah. we we then exceed the bounds of the identity of the accent if we break it down into its constituent parts, right? If we break it down phonetically, for instance, right? Inevitably, if we choose to, if we choose to disrupt its composition mm -hmm. and reduce its composition, mm. inevitably, we're going to stray away from, its, from the identity that it retains in, com in composition, right? Yeah. So for instance, the Chicago accent, right? It's composed of a particular phonetic sound. And if we were to break down the phonetic sounds, inevitably if broken down and dispersed, we would find that the identity that those phonemes happen to compose yeah. is lost in the dispersal. Yeah. Now that I, I, now I'm tempted, I'm tempted to think of it that way, but that, that's, I think that's incorrect. But I think what I mean is that the, Whatever it is, whatever it is that is unconcealed in, in the process of listening carefully to that accent yeah. becomes other than the accent. Yes. Oh, and especially given the context here, it's kind of like, let's keep thinking, let's keep, let's keep reading. We're, we're, we're trying to, you know. Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah. There's, there's, some, there's, there's something, there's something to this. I think, I think what we're, we're struggling with, what we're struggling with here Okay, let, maybe let's talk about that. Well, why are we struggling? This is a good question. I think one of one of the reasons why that we're trying to arrive, yeah, we're trying to equate the unconcealment with the call of some originary feature or some originary form. Now that might be my fault because I keep defaulting to a bit of a platonic perspective, and yeah. that doesn't always comport yeah. with Heidegger. So you know that 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 periodic blindness is well acknowledged but i think what we're trying to do is is when, when we speak of essence as opposed to appearance we speak of origin yeah ontologically right not temporally yeah, yeah. but we do speak of ontological origin when we speak of appearance or when we speak of essence contra appearance and it's difficult to arrive at essence contra appearance without either disassembling appearance like I might be tempted to do with the accent phonetically. And that's, that's, that's not, it's an instinct that kicks in, but it's definitely an enlightenment instinct. It's not the right one, I think, in this right. case. Right. But, but then it's, it's, it's easy to lapse into that. And then it's also easy to lapse into a temporal origin. Yeah. And neither of them are adequate. Yeah. So what it means to see Greek in the source of its reality has something to do with its coming into being that becomes observable in the aletheia of its unconcealment. Yeah, yeah. And that has something to do with the essence of... That has something to do with the presence. You were talking before about the presence of its appearance. Yeah. And the presence of its appearance, mm. the presence of its appearance you know what? I'm just trailing off here. Let's yeah. keep going. yeah, let's keep going. yeah in in trying to uh, mm -hmm. in wondering why we're getting stuck, I inevitably tried to 
to re to re-engage with it and got stuck again. <laughs> Couldn't even sustain the meta conversation. Just got probably, right back into the conversation it's probably all itself. By design, right? It's probably all by design, knowing this thing. Right. Even in trying to retreat from it, yeah, to diagnose the interrogation, inevitably I got I got roped back into the interrogation. Yeah. yeah. What a bugger. Okay. Yeah. Totally. Well, this is also what he I think he was talking about up here. Something okay. about like um it's like a koan. Yeah, it's also it's uh when he when he was talking about uh let's see. Really in contrast, it was where he was talking about like basically anyways, let's just keep going. All right, so you go next. So then the last line. Oh how <laughs> how how appropriate. Then what is it? <laughs> then what is it? Okay. It seems to me no answer to this question is in, um, incumbent on us. It seems to me no answer to this question is incumbent on us, nor would an answer help us. <laughs> because what matters is, um, is, is to see appearance as the reality of presence in its essential origin. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right. We're on to something, maybe. Let me just read that part again. It seems to me, he, the Japanese person says, what was that again? And then he says, oh, okay. Well, let me say it again. It seems to me to answer, um, it, it seems to me no answer to this question is incumbent on us, nor would an answer help us. But what matters is to see appearance as the reality of presence in its essential origin. See appearance as the reality of presence in its essential origin. It doesn't sound very Kantian to me. Nope. If you succeed with that, then you are thinking of appearance in the Greek way. And at the same time, no longer in the Greek way. You said, at least this was the sense of what you said, that we leave the sphere of the subject-object relation behind us when thinking enters into the experience just mentioned in which the real origin of appearance, dare we say, itself appears? Hardly. But you are touching on something essential. For in the source of appearance, something comes toward man that holds the twofold of presence and present beings. Let me say <clears throat> let me say that again. Hardly. But you are touching on something essential. So basically, the thing he's touching on essential is, dare we say, itself appears. The origin itself appears. Okay. Hardly. But you are touching on something essential. For in the source of appearance something comes toward man that holds the twofold of appearance and present beings. That twofold of presence and present beings has already offered itself to man, although its nature remained veiled. Man, to the extent he is man, listens to this message. And that happens even while man gives no particular attention to the fact that he has ever listening already to that message. Man is used for hearing the message. Man is used. It's <laughs> an interesting phrase. Man is used for hearing the message. This you called a while ago. Man stands in relation. And the relation is called hermeneutical because it brings the tidings of that message. This message makes the claim on man that he respond to it. To listen and belong to it as man. 
Huh. And this is what you call being human. If you hear still admit the word being. Man is the message bearer of the message which the two folds unconcealment speaks to him. Man is the message bearer of the message. Bear the message with which the twofold folds unconcealment speaks to him. As far as I'm able to follow what you're saying, I Wait, sense it. Okay, he's having a hard time too. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> I sense a deeply concealed kinship with our thinking, precisely because your path of thinking and its language are so wholly other. Hmm. Your admission agitates me in a way which I can I can control only because we remain in dialogue. But there is one question I cannot leave out. Which? The question of the sight in which the kinship that you sense comes into play. Your question reaches far. How so? The distance is the boundlessness which is shown to us in Ku, which means the sky's emptiness. Then man, as the message bearer of the message of the twofolds on concealment, would also be he who walks the boundary of the boundless. And on this path, he seeks the boundaries mystery. Which cannot be hidden in anything other than the voice that determines and tunes its nature. What are we now saying? Forgive the we. Oh, sorry, hang on, let me take that again. What we are now saying, forgive the we, can no longer be discussed on the strength of the metaphysical notion of language. Presumably, this is what you tried to suggest when you were turning, you tr this is what you tried to suggest that you were turning away from that notion by giving your lecture course the title, Expression and Appearance. The entire course remained a suggestion. I never did more than follow a faint trail, but follow it, I did. The trail was almost imperceptible, imperceptible, promise, it was almost imper, imperceptible promise announcing that we would be set free into the open, now dark and perplexing, now again, lightning sharp like a sudden insight, which then in turn eluded every effort to say it. Later too, and being in time, your discussion of language remains quite sparse. Even so, after our, after our dialogue, you may want to read section 34 in being in time more closely. I've read it many times and each time regretted that you keep it so short. But I believe that now I see more clearly the full import of the fact that the hermeneutics and language belong together. The full import into what direction? Toward a transformation of thinking, a transformation which, however, cannot be established as readily as a ship can alter its course and even less can be established as the consequence of an accumulation of the results of philosophical research. The transformation occurs as a passage. In which one side is left behind in favor of another. And that requires that the site be placed in discussion. One side is metaphysics. And the other, we leave it without a name. Okay, so this is interesting. So it's like, 
here we are again, or maybe it's the same one. It's like we're what we're we're walking, we're walking along, we're circumambulating in a sense, right? Around around the hole of the donut, right? And that there's an awareness, it seems on both of their part, that that's important, mm -hmm. right? Because it seems to be on some level what they're what's what's fascinating is 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 that the thing that they're aware that remain unspoken directly and nameless, right? In some sense, is the origin of something, mm. right? Which the origin, like the more common sense notion, is the origin is behind us, right? But there's a way in which the origin is somehow is to for now is to remain nameless, which implies that there's a sense in which we're moving toward it in some way. Mm. But this kind of sense of the sense of an of of emerging negativity, or it's like a proactive ne ne negativity, mm -hmm. right? And then he was talking about before this this kinship, right? Well, what does the kinship rest on? And that's when he started bringing up, like, essentially their word for emptiness, like "ku." I think it was. Yeah, yeah. It's like the sense of it's like the sense of kinship is 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 an expression of the equidistance they have to the no thingness of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. To what is negated in the conversation? To what the conversation knowingly negates? Right. And they have a kind of yeah kind of ontological equidistance from it yeah and so, they're issuing from and returning to it right and that's why that's why it draws the circumambulatory motion that you just described yeah now i'm kind of going back to our last conversation that we had with john where you brought mm. i've kind of listened to it a number of times this particular part where you brought it kind of together this kind of point, and I'm just kind of keeping that in mind here with this of like where at some point, once it starts to flow and the fellowship's there and the, and, and the logos starts to flow. And when it goes to dialogos is where you start to, you said, think with your speech and, and listen, um, what was it? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Th think with your speech. Although it's funny when I think about it now, it could, it could have easily listen. said, "Listen with your speech." I yep. suppose it could it could be either and both. Yes. Insofar as they, insofar as they, they, they become coterminous, right? right? Thinking, listening. But yes, fundamentally, that you begin to think with your speech and listen with your silence. Yeah, yeah. On just this move right here, this just this sense of what's happening with speaking and listening right when he says um and the other we leave it without a name okay <laughs> so it's like that's an interesting thing that seems to be something to to respond to a question and to say we leave it without a name right mm -hmm. so the mm -hmm. topic in which we're both beholding we're beholding mm -hmm. in right right it's sorry okay so let's go back to that this this thinking this thinking this thinking uh uh speaking or this listening yeah. speak it's funny we can draw we can draw it in a couple of different ways yeah but i think what's in in, in a way what's happening if we can think of the inversion that's happened here is that and I don't know when in the dialogue the inversion happens. Maybe, maybe, maybe it happens right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But that what is actually speaking the dialogue is the silence of the dialogue. Yeah. Right. So imagine, and I think that's what I was trying to get at, what you were mentioning in our conversation with John. I think that's what I was trying to get at, that the the that we get to the point, we get to the point in the dialogue where we 
speak with silence and listen with speech, right? It's a complete inversion. And so that's, I think, in a way, what's going on here is yeah. that is that what is truly communicable and the kinship that's described here is communicable in the form of their shared unspoken, yeah. their shared unspoken relation to the naked center that is unfound in the conversation. Right. And they speak of it, they speak of it in between the lines of their dialogue. Yeah. They listen for it by pitching in the form of their speech, yeah. pitching in order to catch it and place it within the bounds of the silence that is opened into the space of the conversation in between what they actually say. Right. So they're using speech to conduct the intelligibility yeah. that only then opens into the presence of their silence. Right. And that's why it is only ever an ostension. It's only ever a livable reference and it's never a semantic referral. Yeah. Or rather, maybe it's the opposite. It's only a livable referral and not a semantic reference. Right. That's it. Do you mean conduct like a maestro or like a copper wire? Ah, both. Initially, I mean it as a copper wire. Yeah. But ultimately, insofar as it becomes a process with some virtual governance, right. I think it becomes the maestro as well. Yeah. Just like, I mean, let's think of Socrates. We talk about Socrates in this way. We've written to Socrates in this way yeah. as the conductor in both senses of that term. Right. And that's the symbolic function, right? Yeah. That's, I mean, one of the properties of a symbol is that is precisely that it, it serves hmm. both of those functions, hmm. both of those meanings of conducting. Hmm. Yeah, so this move, right? It organizes, it, it is, it is, sorry, guy, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Just to get the last thought out, it's, it's because it just, just as the conductor, obviously it's virtual insofar as the conductor does not play the instruments, right? The conductor, the conductor manifests the presence of the organization that coheres the instruments into the logos of their sound. The, think of the presence of the appearance again. I've never thought about it like that with a conductor. That's what a conductor does. I mean, I'm no, no, I'm no, I'm no musician, but as far as I can tell, that's what a conductor does. Totally. So a conductor is like a, it's almost like looking directly at the logos. That's right. That's right. Now, now we could, of course, we could make the, we could make the category mistake very easily an idolatrous mistake of mistaking the conductor herself or himself mm -hmm. with with the logos and of course they're not but they do represent it yeah conduct it and represent it right yes yeah in the same at way that some point, at some point at some point i bet it's one of those things where the conductor is going to say that like no the the people who are playing are doing I'm following the people who are playing, right? There, I right. bet. I bet a conductor ends up saying that somewhere, right? Right. When they get yes, into flow, exactly, right? Exactly. Totally. I'm sure good conductors would say that. I'm sure good conductors would struggle to would struggle to find the moment of cause and effect between their conducting uh, and the actual the actual shifts in between the. Yeah. you know, between the musical phrases and whatnot, right? I'm sure they wouldn't say, yes, I conduct and then they play. No, no, no. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's, yeah. I'm sure it is, um, I'm sure it, 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 the phenomenology of it, I'm sure is, is, appears simultaneously. Yeah. Manifests simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah. We leave it without a name. Okay. So we leave it without a name. We leave it. It's so interesting. He says, he's speaking for both of them, right? Like in some sense, we, we leave it without a name. 
He could have said, I leave it without a name or I won't give it a name. But he says, we. And Heidegger never, you know, randomly fucking puts anything, you know. So we leave it without a name. So in some sense, they're giving, it's probably fair to say that they're giving themselves more and more over to the silence being the conductor of them, right? Yeah. Right. That's and right. That, and that that word we, I think, starts to show that, right? That's starts right. to show that. That's right. Yeah. Because it's like, don't you find that their ambition, their their like their ambition to actually be their ambition to identify with their speech is actually very measured. They don't seem to have any great ambitions with the precision of their speech. They do, they do insofar as they do insofar as they're describing the relationship with what is being referred. Yeah. But they have no ambition to describe what is being referred. Only their relationship to it. Right. Because to describe oh. their relationship oh. to oh. it is is to present an enacted definition that serves the place of what is actually being discussed. Right. Right. To serve the place of what's that. That's an important word, place. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's mark place, because that may be... Let's, let's, let's put a place marker on place. <laughs> All right, you're next, Mr. Japanese philosopher. Uh, right, meanwhile, I could find it more and more puzzling how Count Kuki could get the idea that he could expect your path of thinking to be of help to him in his attempts in aesthetics since your path in leaving behind metaphysics also leaves behind the aesthetics that is grounded in metaphysics. But leaves it behind in such a way that we can only now give thought to the nature of aesthetics. Okay, I think he's, he's that this, this harkens back to what, to the origin, I think, right? Coming mm. back to the origin and thinking the origin more originally than the Greeks could, being more Greek than the Greeks in it, right? So I think right, right. hearkening back to that. So there's this, okay, there's another like level of things, these the circles that are yeah. happening in the, the which in, in themselves are herme, hermeneutic, circumambulating. Right. Um, perhaps it was this project that attracted Kuki for, he was, oh, wait a minute. No, that's, I'm sorry. Oh, let me do this. Go back. You're, read, you're reading the Japanese philosopher. Yep. But leaves it, um, but leaves it behind yeah. in such a way that we can only now give thought to the nature of aesthetics and direct it back within its boundaries. Perhaps it was this prospect that attracted Kuki, for he was much too sensitive and much too thoughtful to concern himself with the calculus of mere doctrines. He used the European rub Rubik aesthetics, but what he thought and searched for was something else. Okay, here's another thing. Okay, so here's another thing, something else, right? And he goes, dot, dot, dot. So now I'm just starting to hear all of the, all the things that we're not saying. That's right. That they're not That's right. circling That's around. That's right. Mm -hmm. A word, and he says, a word I dare not translate even now. Yeah. But perhaps you are now in a better position to describe the veiled hint that the word gives us. The veiled hint that the word gives us. only after you have clarified the nature of the aesthetic. That has already been done in the course of our dialogue. Wait a minute. That has already been done in the course of our dialogue. 
precisely where we did not specifically speak of it. Okay, now we're bringing back the thing that we didn't speak of and saying we covered it already. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> That we, <laughs> that we already, uh, that has already been done in the course of the dialogue, precisely where we did not specifically speak of it. Okay, so right there, he's saying like, he actually didn't say not speak of it. We did not specifically. Specifically speak of it. Right. And that's true. And yeah. that's, yeah. Uh huh. You mean when we discuss the subject object relation? Well, where else? <laughs> Aesthetics, or shall we say experience within the sphere in which it sets the standard from the very start turns the art, the artwork into an object for our feelings and ideas. Only when the artwork has become an object, only then is it fit for the exhibition in museums. Okay, that's a rich thing right there you just said. And fit also to be valued and appraised. Artistic quality becomes a distinguishing factor in our contemporary modern art experience. Or shall we say straight out in the art business? But what is artistic? is defined with reference to creativity and vir virtuosity. Does art, this is a good question. Does art subsist in the artistic or is it the other way around? All talk about the artistic seems to reveal that precedence is given to the artist. As the subject who remains related to the work as his object. But this is the framework in which all aesthetics belongs. That framework is so treacherous. That is to say, so all embracing that it can capture also all kinds of experience of art and its nature. So basically it's talking, they're talking about like where art is now inframed, right? Mm -hmm. Art is right. Gestell, right? That's Gestell. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. It can embrace, but never make its own. This is why I fear now more than ever that every explication of a key will fall into the clutches of aesthetic ideation. It would depend. Will you try? Key is the gracious. It's the gracious. As soon as you say this, we are at once in the midst of aesthetics. Think of um, Schiller's tre treatise on grace and dignity. That treatise, just as his later letters of aesthetic, education of man was inspired by the dialogue with Kant's aesthetics. If I am rightly informed, both works contributed a decisive stimulus for Hegel's aesthetics. And so it would be presumptuous if we now try to convince ourselves with a few mark remarks that we have mastered the nature of aesthetics. But speaking only by and large, I may attempt to detach a key, which we have just translated with grace from aesthetics, that is to say, from the subject-object relation. I do not now mean gracious in the sense of a stimulus that enchants. That is not in the realm of what stimulates of impressions of, how do you say that? A, a, I think it's aesthesis. Aesthesis, but? Rather in the opposite direction. But I am aware that with this indication, I still remain embroiled in the realm of aesthetics. If we keep this 
reservation in mind. There is no harm in your trying to give the explication just the same. The key is the breath of the stillness of luminous delight. <laughs> what a line. The yeah. breath of the stillness of luminous delight. You understand delight literally then as what ensnares carries away into stillness. There is in it nothing anywhere of stimulus and impression. The delight is of the same kind as the hint that beckons on and beckons to and fro. The hint, however, is the message of the veiling that opens up. Message of the veiling that opens up. It's a turn of phrase there. Then all presence would have its source in grace, in the sense of the pure delight of the becoming, the beckoning stillness. I'll read it again. Then all presence would have its source in grace in the sense of the pure delight of the beckoning stillness. The fact, sorry, did you want to add anything? Nope. No. The fact that you give ear to me or better, to the probing intimations I propose, awakens me in the confidence to drop my hesitations, which have so far kept me from answering your question. You mean the question, which, um, which word in your language speaks for what we Europeans call language? Up to this moment, I have shied away from that word because I must give a translation which makes our word for language look like a mere pictograph, to wit, something that belongs within the precincts of conceptual ideas. For European science and its philosophy try to grasp the nature of language only by way of concepts. Yeah. Concept and grasp are very linked. I think there's mm. also, because the, Greek, the Greeks didn't have they didn't have concept and thought bound up with it, right? I think that's also key here too. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what that's is, a good point. What is to think that isn't a grasping, right? That's right. So, so in fact, in some way, to I mean, they certainly have grasping in the in the sense of gnosis. Yeah, but then that, but that's, but that's that's. That's a very, as we know, it's a very specific kind of apprehension. Yeah. It's like knowing by being it or something, right? Qua knowing qua being. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, and then, right. and then, so like in some sense, grasping, pre yeah. So, grasping is it already precludes an object, right? So, that's it. This is what's tricky about this. And this is what, this is why I think they're being so careful, right? Because unless they allow it to, to come to them in some sense. I think what they're saying is that the danger is, is that we'll prehend it. And in naming mm -hmm. it, it'll be correct, but it won't be true, right? Right. Which, are very, which is very different. That's right. That's right. Hmm. Okay, so what, where were we? Uh, it's you. What is the Japanese word? Okay. Oh, yeah. What is the Japanese word for language? And there's a par parenthetical comment here that says, after further hesitation, it is kotoba. I think that's the pronunciation. I'm not certain. Yeah. Good enough for government work. Um, and what does that say? <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Ba means leaves, including and especially the leaves of a blossom, petals. Think of cherry blossoms or plum blossoms. And what does koto mean? Koto say. This is the question most difficult to answer, but it is easier now to attempt to answer because we have ventured to explain a key. The pure delight of the beckoning stillness, the breath of stillness that makes this beckoning delight come into its own is the rain under which that delight is made to come. But Koto always also names that which in the event gives delight itself, that which uniquely in each unrepeatable moment comes to radiance in the fullness of its grace. I'm going to read that again. Yeah, please. This is the question most difficult to answer, but it is easier now to attempt an answer because we have ventured to explain a key. The pure delight of the beckoning stillness. The breath of stillness that makes this beckoning delight come into its own is the rain under which that delight is made to come. Okay. But Koto always also names that which in the event gives delight itself that which uniquely in each unrepeatable moment comes to radiance in the fullness of its grace. Koto then would be the appropriating occurrence of the lightning, the light, lighting message of grace. Koto then would be the appropriating occurrence of the lighting message of grace it's i think it's the lightening lightening message of grace very very subtle difference but yeah in this case it probably it's probably worlds of difference yeah. it would be the appropriate occurrence of the lightening lightening message of grace right beautifully said only the word grace easily misleads the modern mind leads it away into the precinct of impressions. Whose corollary is always expression as the manner in which something is set free. It seems to me more helpful to turn to the Greek word charis, which I found in, uh, in the lovely saying that you quote from Sophocles in your lecture, poetically man dwells mm. and translated graciousness. This saying comes closer to putting into words the breath-like advent of the stillness of delight. And something else, too, that I want to say there, but could not offer within the context of the lecture. Is that charis? Charis? Charis. Charis. I think, yeah. Is there called um, tikitausa? that which brings forward and forth. Our German word, dichten, tikton, says the same. Thus, Sophocles' lines portend to us that graciousness is itself poetical, is itself what really makes poetry, the welling up of the message of the two folds on concealment. Wow. The welling up of the message of the two folds on concealment. Yeah, that's fucking, that's, yeah. That's fucking with a PH. <laughs> <laughs> I would need more time than our dialogue allows to follow in thought the new prospects you have opened up with your remark. You have opened with your remark. But one thing I see at once, that your remark helps me to say more clearly what Koto is. And that seems to me indispensable. If I am to think at all adequately your Japanese word for language, kotoba, along with you. 
you may you well remember that point in our dialogue where I named to you the Japanese words allegedly corresponding to the distinction between asteton and nuaton. Yuro and ku. Yuro means more than color and whatever can be perceived by the senses. Ku, the open, the sky's emptiness, means more than the suprasensible. You could you could not say in what the more the more consists. But now I can follow a hint which the two words hold. In which direction do they hint? Toward the source from which the mutual interplay of the two comes to pass. Which is? Koto, the happening of the lightening message of the graciousness that brings forth. Koto would be the happening holding sway. Holding sway over that which needs the shelter of all that flourishes and flowers. Then, as the name for language, what does koto ba say? Language, heard through this word, is the petals that stem from koto. That is a wonder, or, or a wondrous word, and therefore inexhaustible to our thinking. The mm. name something other than our names, understood metaphysically, present to us, language, glossa, linguia, langu langue. For, for long now, I have been loath to use the word language when thinking on its nature. But can you find a more fitting word? I believe I have found it, but I would guard it against being used as a current tag and corrupted to signify a concept. Hmm. Yeah, so in other Which... words, what just got presence here is not a concept, right? Feels safe. No. Really does, there's certainly, right? There's certainly feel, like, I feel that kind one. of inside of it. At some point I was just like, whoa, I could feel the sense of being in something different. I love the, the, the metaphor of the petals that stem from Koto. Yeah. That's, uh, that's quite beautiful. Right. That's so quite beautiful. feel like we're a true twofold bear. Yes. You know, it's interesting. Yeah. There's one more thing and then we'll, so I think I need to wrap it up here. Um, yeah, yeah, but no the, problem. I'm just curious if we just read this one thing that we were trying to read before, just hear what it sounds like now. Okay, here it is. There's that one, that one that we were kind of stuck on for a while. It can be readily explained with a view to the essence of appearance. <laughs> if to be present itself is thought of as appearance, then there prevails in being present the emergence into openness in the sense of unconcealedness. This unconcealedness comes about in the unconcealment as clearing. But this clearing itself as occurrence remains unthought in every respect. To enter into thinking this unthought occurrence means to pursue more originally what the Greeks have thought, to see it in the source of its reality, to see it so is in its own way Greek, and yet in respect of what it sees is no longer, is never again Greek. There's something that's now that you now that you reread that, mm -hmm. it seems to me maybe this is a little too plain. There's more to it than this, but he's really talking about a transparency opacity shift. Yeah. 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 Fundamentally. Right. And once the shift, once the, the shift has, has been undertaken aspectually, hmm. what is known can no longer be identical with what was known. 
because it's knowingness is transparent yeah the world of its own nativity right yeah that if it becomes a way by which to see its seenness yeah can never belong to a category or can never be is 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 no longer relevant to the category of its former identity if it's become something through which to see right or or in reverse if the shift takes place in the other direction right right so gorgeous to see that to you know to become to become to become the greek thought and to see and to see by view of being being thought in greek it is no longer greek Because if the thought becomes deed, if it becomes being, yeah. then the thought has traced itself through to its call. Mm. And as its call, it's no longer the thought that chases. Yeah, it is. It is. Huh. And there's your shunyata, yeah, I think. I was going to say, on home ground. There's your shunyata on its home ground. It no longer thinks after that which it is, yeah. because it is. Right. And it thinks on the side of... The emptiness. Yes. Yeah. That shift. Right. Because it's spoken back into its silence. Right. Right. Huh. Wow. Interesting. I'm talking to tomorrow. I'm talking to um. The what's his name? The um. The, the narcissist, narcissistic, uh, psychologist. Yeah. And I want to talk with him about this, this sense of, um, you know, in, it, is it fair to say that something like logos, the opposite of logos is narcissism? Well, that's an interesting idea. The opposite of logos is narcissism. Mm. Oh, what is he going to say to that? That'll be an interesting conversation. Yeah, it totally will. It totally will. Yeah. He, he claims that he's a, he's a full-fledged narcissist himself. A, self, a self-identifying narcissist, right? Yeah, well, he's, you know, he basically put it on the map, apparently, you know, as it's understood, mm -hmm. you know, today. He's an expert on it, I guess. All right. But he also talks about nothingness, and this is what's interesting about him. I'm, he also talks about, and I want to talk with him about some of his, kind of his epistemological, ontological grounding of, you know, of how we, you know, what is a, what is a psychological diagnosis? What is it actually, right? Yeah, and how does a narcissist speak with veracity about the no thingness of the self? That's 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 uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good one.
So I thought it'd be just interesting, like, I mean, if he lets me, right, um, into the phenomenology of being, as he would say, is like, there's no, like, there's no one there back there. It's dead. The self is dead, like in the, in that sense. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. It'd be interesting. I'm looking forward to talking with him. Mm, okay i'm gonna look forward to watching that let yeah. me know how uh, let me know what next time we chat you'll you can let me know what the experience is like yeah um, really great thank you thank you as always but this was really 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 great thank you i think we we bent ourselves into all kinds of interesting positions Absolutely. on this one especially Absolutely. maybe it's yeah it's i don't know if it's the the lateness of the hour here at the moment or whatnot but i i definitely feel like i've been wrong yeah. but but very uh very yeah. very contentedly wrong Me yeah too. yeah there is a contentment yes so good nice nice trying to put skin on the hold the donut with you get on the holy ghost yeah it always is thank you my friend Mwah. all right till next time bye. till soon bye